Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for attending this session. I'm Michael Massa. I'm the co-founder of Ozarka, uh, which is a sustainable food packaging company based in the Netherlands. And I'm really pleased. Um, so... Although, now I look at the number, I see we have nobody in attendance. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hold off here on introductions. Uh, I believe it's just the five of us right now. Are they recording this, though? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, let's go. <laughs> yeah, well, let's go. Hey, well, great conversation amongst <laughs> right. ourselves. Who cares? That's <laughs> right. You're missing out. All right. Yeah. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, in a moment, I'll briefly introduce our panelists, who will then tell us a bit more about their work and how it relates to the panel topic, and uh, then we'll begin addressing some of the core questions for the session. Uh, please note that there is additional biographical information about our panelists in the chat window, and of course, I encourage attendees to also use chat for additional questions. We'll try and get to all of them during the session. So first, we have Ned Clunan who's the founder of Ned Clunan Associates, a partner at Wayfair Ventures, and member of the Strategy and Development Committee at the Global Leadership Foundation. We also have Pina Hirano, the founder and CEO of Asteria Corporation, which is a listed company on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, which produces a flagship enterprise data integration software, Asteria Warp. Orlando Remedios, the co-founder and CEO of Sensefinity, an IoT company that helps customers gain insights and optimize their operations by monitoring production and by real-time tracking through global supply chains. And Deborah Weinswig, the CEO and founder of CoreSight Research, which helps retail clients accelerate innovation and growth by focusing on disruption at the intersection of retail and technology. So I guess we'll start with something that's a, a primary concern just about everyone these days, uh, the pandemic. Um, so I'd like to invite each of the panelists to discuss their business a bit more, um, how it relates to the panel topic, and especially the impact of COVID-19 and what it's had on their work. So um, let's flip uh, the alphabetical order here, and we'll start with Deborah. I guess I drew the short straw, but um, so we, um, as I mentioned, when we were kind of uh, just in our pre-conference chat, uh, Coresight does a significant amount of business in terms of bringing Western companies to China and also studying the market. And let's just, and we also work with a lot of startups. So let's just say um, we saw much of what was happening earlier than our, our Western peers. And I remember I was in the office of a very large retailer in late February last year. And I'm like, you know, we're seeing, you know, this, you know, real focus on health and wellness and like there's like cloud clubbing. So, you know, usually you dance around together or you might dance around by yourself in your home, but now you're dancing around your home by yourself with a bunch of other people dance around their homes by themselves. And just, you know, this idea that we were starting to see significant changes in, in consumption and engagement, like live commerce, which had already been very significant, uh, was, you know, we, we estimated about a $300 billion industry this year in China compared to about 11 billion in the US. And we, we really saw this kind of significant uptake in innovation, right, where you had, you know, kind of drone delivery and whatnot. And so taking all that, translating it back to the West, and then helping US retailers think about their, their kind of uh, move into China and when that um, might be, we hosted a pitch fest on 9:15 for Alibaba and brought 10 startups to China who had never even thought about going there and saw tremendous success. And so I would say it was we took everything we learned, we translated it to another market, and we we really started to to think about right the possibilities, which were endless. And I think it's given all of us time to be more creative, think about different ways of engaging. But, you know, I would say last last March and April were, were certainly time to take a pause and, uh, you know, think about how we might add value and also, um, you know, take what we learn in other markets and apply it to to other geographies. That was that was the experience for Coresight. See. OK. And how about um, Orlando, if you could tell us a bit more about uh, Sensefinity and uh, the uh, influence of uh, COVID on, on your work. Mm -hmm. At Sensefinity, we are digitalizing supply chains, and uh, 
given the disruptions that the world supply chain suffered during 2020 and are still suffering, a lot of companies became aware of uh, the shortcomings that they had in their processes and the visibility of their supply chains, as well as uh, the importance of some of the goods they were transporting beforehand and uh, uh, never really got um, got to see. And uh, this uh, brought really uh, a great um, a great focus on on the supply chain topics. So the supply chain digitalization. Uh, pandemic uh, regulations and uh, uh, supply chains got uh, completely disrupted. Additionally, the complex supply chain for vaccines is now a major concern. So overall, I think um, people started looking more into the supply chains, what still needs to be done in digitalizing these supply chains. And uh, uh, people became aware that the world that uh, seems to work, at least in the Western world, very well, in the developed world uh, now started to uh, seem not guaranteed anymore. And this really triggered a, a huge need for supply chain visibility, supply chain management systems, and our business as a whole. So it's currently expanding. And I believe in the next five years, we will transform uh, supply chains to become uh, digital and more resilient for the, for the coming future. Okay. All right. Um, and I guess, uh, Pino, would you like to go next and uh, talk a bit more about uh, Asteria? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> hmm? So we, Asteria, uh, is a uh, enterprise software company um, dedicated for the connectivity software. So uh, we started our company 22 years ago, actually uh, from the support of uh, supply chain at that time. So we support uh, Sony uh, and uh, Intel connection on their supply chain. And then uh, we support Kyocera and Nokia connection uh, on their supply chain. And at that time, uh, we use uh, the, they, they wanted to change uh, their connection uh, for the paper to internet, uh, fax based <laughs> to internet. So that our, um, <clears throat> um, Software is expanding from supply chain to now. Nowadays, it's uh, everything. So now, uh, the over nine thousand uh, companies uses our software, Asteria Warp, for the connectivity. So it actually uh, <coughs> uh, support uh, decreasing or other uh, eliminating the paper consumption in, in the supply chain, and not only. Uh, the supply chain, but everything, every office work. And uh, for the, about the COVID-19 in Japan, there's a, a lot of uh, remote work are required in this situation. And uh, also many company um, <clears throat> uh, need to uh, move to online connection rather than paper-based. So uh, we actually uh, supported a lot of companies like uh, 1,500 companies uh, to make their more online connection to do the telework or the remote work. Also, uh, the one last thing, as you can see, uh, the our corporate color is green. So we aim to be green society. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, and uh, Ned. Please uh, explain a bit more about the influence of the pandemic on uh, your work. Okay, with well, two two entities that I'm involved in. Number one, Wayfair Ventures is an early stage investment firm for startups in the travel and tourism and hospitality sector. So you can imagine the impact that this has had on that sector, and we have sort of put on pose, you know, put on you know, uh, delayed some of our investments and so on and so forth as we watch a lot of this shake out. You know, the tourism sector, the hotel sector has been devastated. We know that. And it's going to look different even when we come out of this. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, you know, the, the green issue for the travel and tourism industry was 
um, was basically over tourism, right? Too many people showing up at too many places. And actually the Netherlands, you know, has a very strong tourism policy about trying to people, prevent people from coming to Amsterdam, right, as part of it. So we, uh, you know, it's gone from over tourism to like a touchless world and to a more healthy environment. And we're looking at some technologies associated with that, but a little bit more into the forward looking transportation aspect of post COVID-19 greening travel and tourism sector. So that's what we're looking at there. Now, flip side, the other entity that I run is basically, it's basically Ned Clune and External Affairs, Ned Clune Associates. You know, I spent many, many years working directly for, for a CEO of a Fortune 50 company. And uh, my business is to work with C-suites and boards of directors on their external affairs strategies, um, The which means everything from government, government affairs, new business development, their philanthropic approach, anything they do to try to focus on external stakeholders that are challenging their company. Now that's, you know, I would say the impact from COVID-19 is that the change in politics in the United States. COVID-19 delivered a new president, um, that's for sure. Every, and we now have new agendas. And if you look at, the, in anticipation of this phone call, I looked at the uh, Daily Register, and, which is, lists the meetings that are taking place in Washington on a, on a daily basis. In every, and I'm not saying 95%, I'm saying 100% of every meeting on Capitol Hill today has a climate change component to it, 100%. is now an issue that's on everybody's table and which means in the United States, it's another issue for weaponizing, you know, and uh, we're in the midst of it now in a way that I've never seen it before, which has changed. So I'm working with CEOs and work with board members about how they're going to position their companies, regardless of what sector they're in, to, you know, with this new firm and the new politics that was driven primarily by COVID-19. Okay. I think one of the things you mentioned there in particular uh, is maybe a good way to bridge into one of the other topics um, that we're to touch on here. And um, I'm saying this because uh, you mentioned uh, politics and um, without, you know, being overtly political, of course, in many ways, um, the very concept of uh, greening of a supply chain, uh, on the one hand, it it seems to me a very scientific issue, but naturally, uh, as with so many things, uh, these do become politicized. And another thing that does as well is the concept of uh, reshoring. And I think in uh, particular, um, Ned, you had some thoughts uh, that you wanted to share on um, reshoring and how it uh, relates to uh, supply chain greening. Right. Well, um, you know, just all things, you know, kind of kind of relate to China, right? In, in a way, in, in, in what you're talking about here, the shot heard around the world in the United States and maybe elsewhere was when it became clear that we could not supply ourselves with medical. Americans never heard of what supply chains are, but now they do know. They do know what it is, and they have a loose idea what it is. And uh, it's going to be on the agenda for a long time. So that brings fast forward to the idea of reshoring. You know, America always had an, an industrial policy, but it was basically offshoring. You know, you know, uh, offshoring to Japan first, South Korea, China, and so on and so forth. Uh, but now I think it's going to have a new industrial policy. Uh, nationwide policy for reshoring and reshoring may be the best chance for the greening of supply chains in America by providing the kind of political, if you will, cover that you need to introduce the kind of thoughts that were delivered under a different name, under 
the Green New Deal, right? So the Green New Deal basically is the progressive agenda in the United States. That's how it's seen, right? Rightly or wrong, I'm not making a political statement. The idea of reshoring provides, you know, a, 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 an ability for both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, to try to find some common ground, you know, in the, under the guise of national security and the security of critical infrastructure and technologies going forward. This narrative has more of a chance to bring more greening activity in this country than any other, you know, uh, policy that I've seen in a long time. So I think reshoring, you know, uh, is going to be a useful, helpful tool in this country. We'll hear more about it, and I think it has great potential. Okay. If it's okay, I would like to jump in on that as well. We um, very early on in the pandemic, uh, once again, we were we started a charity called Retailers United, which was to try and help match demand with supply. And there was a, an AI component, so we weren't playing God. The the AI ultimately was. But the, we ended up working very closely with Congresswoman Maloney and introduced a bill into Congress around, and it was, you know, kind of exactly, you know, this whole idea of both sides of the aisle. And the idea was that companies were required to make 25% of their PPE here domestically. Now, what was fascinating is trying to find enough capacity for that and, and how that changed, right, the, the supply chain. And this whole, I sit on the board of AFA, which is the American Apparel and Footwear Association, and right this is exactly what we kind of have been focusing on is nearshoring, reshoring, and onshoring. And what's very interesting, which you know many in the audience may or may not be aware of, is that for in India, for example, the government requires foreign brand companies, who, like our mono brands, to source 30% of the value of the goods procured for sale in India if the brand's investment is over 51% in its India operations. And so this idea, right, that that we need to kind of rethink how, um, you know, kind of companies and retailers and whether it's, you know, kind of precious metals or otherwise, what we can do to kind of, you know, not only think about cutting down the time and supply chain, right? We've got this port congestion, container, lack of containers, right? Container prices are up 4.5x versus a year ago. And, you know, if we think about, I spend a lot of time in the holiday season, the time with which, right, we're going to need to elongate the supply chain, bring product in early, pay additional like, costs to hold it, that there is a huge opportunity around this. And then the whole C to M, right, which is customer to manufacturer, where we're also starting to make just in time as well. And, you know, huge opportunity in terms of greening, you know, kind of less waste, less kind of lost in transit, right? 40% of food never actually makes it to the shelf because it expires upon uh, transit. I, I think this is an area we're seeing investment and also just right now with a ESG CSR focus, absolutely the right thing for companies to do. Okay. I believe. Yes, but please. Yes. Yes. I believe actually that digitalization brings uh, now the, the opposite uh, um, in, into play. If we get uh, complete visibility into markets, into demand using machine learning for our forecasting, we are capable of using best of both worlds. First, producing the pro products where they are uh, produced the best. For instance, uh, there is uh, uh, there is always the thinking that uh, pro producing apples in Europe is uh, greener uh, for for European customers than importing them from New Zealand. When actually the opposite is uh, true, the the CO2 footprint of an apple uh, which is imported from New Zealand to Europe with that immense uh, travel is still lower than the the, um, the CO2 footprint of an European apple consumed in Europe. So nearshoring is really uh, more harmful in, in those cases than actually producing uh, the, the produce where it makes more sense. What we can uh, actually do using technology is using it to create complete transparency of the supply chains, of supply chains, uh, uh, problems and using then perfect knowledge of the markets with uh, uh, real time demand for, uh, and uh, and uh, production capabilities to understand what will happen and then use machine learning for forecasting. So using those tools, we will be able to drive down uh, supply chain inefficiencies and uh, actually reduce CO2 impact in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I think um Something you just touched on there is, uh, I, I think, a, a really crucial concept. Um, I, 
traditionally, I think when people think of, um, you know, so-called uh, sustainability issues or, or, or green issues, um, there was uh, a, historically a kind of a, okay, are we going to uh, look at these, uh, what uh, changes we could make uh, in our operations, for example, from a purely economic standpoint, or should we instead uh, do it from a, 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 you know, a more sustainable perspective? And the idea that the technology can actually be leveraged to also make it both greener and more cost efficient, as I think is something that, that people are, you know, starting to digest now. It's, it's really not an either or. But of course, um, those types of examples that you say where um, it, it, it might not seem intuitive that for the uh, Apple, for example, to travel that much uh, farther that, in fact, um, you know, it, so we need to be um, concrete and um, specific. And I think what problems we're trying to address there. Yeah, yes, I need, I think we need uh, data because uh, today everyone has an opinion an uninformed opinion. And we are about to, to lose a lot of uh, of the um, uh, developments that, that our parents gave us, like uh, globalization, like uh, human rights, and we are losing that to to mere opinions which were created in the internet without uh, uh, basic data uh, behind that. And um, Pina, uh, so to discuss this from a, an Asteria perspective, I think when people uh, often think about supply chain, we think more in terms of uh, moving goods. And so, you know, the idea of uh, being more in the software industry, uh, it, it might not be a primary concern. But I suspect at the very least that a lot of your clients uh, are facing these issues in, you know, perhaps a, a more um, concrete way when we're talking about uh, you know, physically moving the, these things. And so I imagine that um, you're very much living with these same issues. Uh, and, and of course, the, uh, the color of your company, I, I think, uh, sends the, the right message there as well. Okay. Yes. Uh, from uh, the IT perspective, uh, we have uh, three points uh, to support our clients, uh, their supply chain. One is... Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, less paper. Um, so the paperless by digital, digitalization <coughs> uh, of their process. So the, as already mentioned, the paper is a, a big issue of um, anti-green uh, society. So the second one is uh, less people involved with the uh, automation by IT. So, uh, when the people, a lot of people involved, it, it also the, uh, the makes more of the, uh, the CO2 um, or the more power energy needed. So less people is also important. Thirdly, uh, as I already discussed, is uh, we can help the effective loading and moving of the transit uh, using AI or more uh, easily some algorithm. So these are three points we are helping uh, in our clients for greener. <clears throat> yes, this year. And uh, we've talked a bit about uh, technology here. So mm -hmm. just maybe to get um, a little bit more specific, and anybody can uh, weigh in on this. Um, one of the things uh, that I've heard uh, people bring up is uh, the problem is not um, data per se or how to acquire that data. It's really we're almost dealing with, um, you know, big data volume and um, proper analytical processes to, to do the right stuff with this data. And I also think that this goes to what you were saying uh, before, uh, Orlando, about, you know, uh, have this kind of uh, data-driven mindset. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering... Um, what are your experiences with, uh, you know, what the key technologies are going to be here really for the kind of low-hanging fruit in um, greening the supply chain? Um, is it purely kind of route optimization and, and th those sorts of things? Or is it, uh, yeah, are these more general issues perhaps? Yes, uh, as uh uh, Barbara uh, shouted out, uh, it makes uh, no sense today that uh, half of our perishables uh, uh, go to waste before they reach consumption. So 
they are really basic things which are broken and which we uh, only don't notice in the developed world because we we pay for the additional amount of work. But that creates additional uh, CO2 and uh, additional waste. And uh, basically, if we bring the the current technology, we don't need the new technology for that. If we bring that into the current uh, supply chains and um, logistics business, then we can use um, not only the rod mechanism and the the um, introduction of the knowledge where in the market the produced goods are, are more needed, but also we can um, avoid um, uh, trucks which don't have full load. Most of the trucks today are are empty because they, they travel a load which can uh, be just half of the truck to, to a supermarket and they come back uh, uh, empty again. So most of the travel that the truck does uh, is actually empty. So th there is a, a lot of optimization possible and uh, optimization technology based on software, on real-time data and on forecasting of demand can bring uh, that um, uh, that usage up so we can increase the usage of the, the trucks using technology. Machine learning will help there for sure in the forecasting part and uh, already um, uh, data analytics and big data brings already enough uh, uh, to reduce the, the current amount of, uh, um, of empty trucks. So current already available technology can bring a lot, uh, a lot of improvement and uh, uh, new technology will further help to, to remove this, um, this current waste. And we can really bring uh, supply chains to, to be so clever that uh, we will not waste this 50% of food in these supply chains anymore. And that should be our goal. Uh, all of us which are working in the software and hardware business uh, for digitalizing the supply chains. Um, could I just say, I wonder if, I, and I throw this out as a question, as a whole, I understand all the logistics and the data and everything like that that you're talking about could be very, very useful. But when you mash that up or combine it with just the simple electrification of all of our vehicles, you know, and the improvement, you know, would that, you know, have even more bigger impact on what the subject is here today as opposed to just logistics? Although I agree with totally with what you're saying. If you're making unnecessary runs or running that only, you know, you have to double the amount of runs to get the same volume out, that obviously doesn't make sense. But when I think of, and that's where I was getting to my reshoring thing and these sort of critical infrastructure, critical industries, we, as a country, I'm speaking of as the United States now, really want to have here, and we want to own that technology, just like France wants to own it, like China wants to own it, like everybody else. You know, we want to own that technology. So we got to bring it back, and we got to figure, we got to figure out ways to do it. Because, you know, the other flip side, what I'm trying to say is we need to have an economy as well, right? Efficiency is the one thing, but we need to have an economy. We need, have, we need to have people engaged in all these process, processes and benefit from these processes, you know, and, you know, we need to find employment out of this. It won't be the same numbers, right? But, you know, the idea of bringing this higher value-added manufacturing and capabilities here, you know, to the United States, as, again, I'm speaking from the U.S. perspective, you know, it's very, very important on the political agenda. And it makes sense for us as a nation to do this. We outsourced to Japan, South Korea, ultimately to China, and then to Vietnam and Mexico, right? Mexico is even a little easier shot for us now. But we need to figure out a way, you know, in targeted industries. I'm not talking about we, we can't go about this in a not talk way. You know, it's going to have to be targeted. We're going to have to, you know, secure our own future and deliver to our own people an economy where they can actually, you know, grow and prosper again. And I think part of what you're saying is is good. The other part of it is not so good. Well, it's it's interesting, right? <clears throat> because also, how do we define? I mean, as somebody who spent you know the bulk of my last ten years in supply chain, everyone defines it differently, right? Like, what mm -hmm. what is your supply chain? Where does it start? Who owns what part of it? And so I think there, there's that aspect. So we can talk about, right, LTL, less than full truckloads. We can think about cross stock. 
we can talk about, right, D to C is that, you know, a much better way to deliver product to customer, you know, solar power, wind power, many of the retailers, right, have, have adopted this as well as it relates to, to supply chain. And, you know, the other area where, you know, once again, related to supply chain is, you know, if you're warehousing it, right, then you're, you've got inventory that isn't, right, active, right? And, and so it's, there's also a waste component there. So I, I do think that the, um, and, and for those of you who aren't aware, in 2020, turnover of employees and like DCs and warehouses was almost 400% because of work conditions and whatnot. And obviously there was a, a fear factor there. So how can we also, you know, kind of create jobs that, you know, are, are more meaningful and where, you know, these employees feel like they're giving back as well, because I think green is, is really critical to everything everybody does. And they want to feel that they're they're contributing. So I, I think that it's still kind of very early, which means I think we can have a big impact. And I, I very much agree, right? We need to own this, you know, here domestically. And we we I think can share out, you know, kind of technology and what we learn, but we also have to figure out, right, there's a an ROIC and it's important to the consumer, to the supplier, and then ultimately to the shareholder. And so I think it's, you know, money that you invest, you'll get back fivefold. I think it's okay. interesting because, uh, I oh, yes, yeah, no, oh, please, right. go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, they're back to the logistic issues. And uh, there's uh, one uh, low-hanging fruit. And uh, for instance, in Tokyo, there's a uh, four major convenience store. And uh, each convenience store has their own uh, transportation of mm -hmm. their goods. And um, my uh, idea uh, for it is a to share the trucks or the uh, unbundle their uh, transportation company so that uh, to decrease the empty truck or the longer route uh, to consume the <clears throat> oil or gasoline. So uh, that kind of unbundling or the sharing, uh, which is uh, one of the trend of our society, uh, could um, make us some greener uh, transportation, that means supply chain. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. And I think that also ties in uh, to what uh, was being said before about, um, you know, one place to start is, you know, uh, full trucks, you know, full loads. Uh, presumably, if you have these four different uh, companies acting in the, the transport capacity, there are not the efficiency that you would get with some sort of consolidation. But it also seems to me that um, there might be a brand issue and a brand strength uh, where some organizations are going to want to maintain um, their own fleet, uh, you know, t which might cut against those uh, issues. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's an interesting yeah. challenge. Yeah. 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 It, it's a challenge. Um, yeah. They need to do some compromise. So why they do th like that is they want to uh, uh, transport right time on demand, such kind of stuff. So that uh, make them a uh, kind of stress. But nowadays, they do all the same. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. I think it is uh, the time to change their uh, differentiator rather than transportation to some other. And this came up earlier um, when we talked about uh, sort of um, the, actually, I apologize this was, uh, before the, we officially started the session, but we were talking about the kind of top-down approach uh, that um, China had been able to implement uh, with respect to uh, greening some of their technologies. But I think most of what we've been talking about today has um, been more uh, brand driven or perhaps kind of public relations, uh, you know, perception of uh, various companies. Um, it, has that uh, been your experience? How, how much of this uh, talk about greening of supply chains is kind of a legislation or regulatory issue? How much of it is is uh, really being driven uh, internally in these organizations who genuinely want to affect these changes themselves without anybody um, putting those uh, external pressures on them? I'm going to jump in because I think what's really interesting, you know, we talked about this is right in China's five-year plan, right? They're, you know, driving decarbonization and indigenous tech innovation, you know, however, right, not, they're, they're proposing, I think, what's realistic in terms of, like, achievable climate actions, they, they are ambitious. But I think that, you know, what we're seeing is they really are looking to assume global leadership and green technologies and sustainable solutions. And I, I think that the, um, you know, we're seeing this kind of from, from the ground up and from top down. 
They also fired right the largest number of green tech patents, and they've their entire like green finance industry. I mean, it's it's just this this like groundswell, and I, I think that it's you know really to kind of everyone kind of working together. So, right, green finance, green standards, green technologies, green factories, green products, this green minded, if you will. And, and I think it's this like, you know, longer term endeavor that's in progress. But ultimately, it is like the, you know, the, the goal of, you know, kind of the, the community and, you know, the government and everyone working together and spending, right? I mean, they're, they're spending by the government to, to enable us. And that I think is, is what's driving it. I, I think that the, um, the core focus of the you know kind of corporations and what we're seeing too is for a lot of the Western companies that we've you know taken to China, they they've actually learned a lot in terms of new processes around supply chain, which is obviously what we're talking about here today. And so you know bringing that supply chain and sharing that intelligence globally, I think ultimately will be critical for the numbers on a, a global basis and a longer term you know greening of the world. And is it fair to say then that, that that's not uh, purely a, a, an issue of goodwill? This is also a good business practice, and this is um, this is not just a, a kind of a. This trend is moving only in one direction. Uh, do, do we do we agree that uh, these issues are being discussed more than ever across every sector? And uh, this is this is the new reality. I well, hope. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, you know, as you're pointing out, China has declared this to be a national strategic objective that run ac runs across all of its sectors and runs across all of its foreign policy initiatives. To ignore that would be stupid. <laughs> you know, that is really, it's an integral part of their foreign policy in Latin America, Africa, and in challenging the footprint of the United States and Europe around the world. I mean, that's just a fact. While we were, unfortunately, and I, and I admire what the Chinese have done on this, but it's heavy subsidization and under a political system that would, you know, that we, none of us could tolerate, right? You know, uh, a lot of the advancements made in the, these technologies were at the expense of a number of, of their own people, right? And also, an excessive pollution levels them, themselves producing, right? So I think, you know, um, it's just, it's important to acknowledge that. And, you know, when we were, when we were fracking, they were subsidizing, right? We were fracking all over the country for our, to get independence from the Middle East, right? They were basically subsidizing, you know, all of these industries that we're here to talk about so that they could achieve their national objectives around the world. It's not just to create a greener future for everybody and to make a speech for Davos, with, uh, which Xi Jinping did. They have a, you know, and I admire what they're doing. We're going to have to match that. Let's say the United States and you know, Europe, you know, uh, are gonna ha we're going to have to match that, you know, because it has to do with, you know, basically, you know, innovating, getting, you know, not like control, but sort of like, owning technologies and owning approaches, being able to share that, they're going to have to share it selectively around the world, you know, uh, you know, uh, in, in the way that China does as well, right? So I just think, you know, that the time is right in the United States to, to organize around this sort of new threat, new challenge, you know, use this phrase reshoring, as I say, for the sake of building industries you know, critical infrastructure that ultimately are going to bring about more of what everybody's talking about here, right? You know, you just need a political, you know, sort of narrative, you know, to, to, to do this in this country. And it's starting to take shape. You know, it's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to have huge regulatory reform here in the Clean Air Act and with the National Economic, you know, uh, uh, Policy Act, we're going to have to find ways to change the the system for environmental impact statements so that we can get new plant and equipment here and to develop these to innovate these technologies. You know, we are, let's say, I'll give you one example for an entire environmental impact statement in this country right now. The average length of time is 10 years and then it's eight years of litigation afterwards, right? To be able to, to, to get, let's say, a new plant going. In Germany, Right, right now, as we speak, and in France, 
right? It's two years. Yeah. So, you know, what we've done, unfortunately, we built, we built a system here whereby we have a new class. It's like a, it's a legal class of activity that actually prevents the advancement and the introduction of green technology. And so, and to, if, oh yes, please go ahead, Pina. Oh, yeah. I'd like to uh, point out one other uh, driver uh, other than uh, regulation or the government kind. So that is the uh, stock market. Nowadays, uh, the investors, uh, especially the uh, institutional uh, investors, uh, very keen on ESG, so sustainability. Actually, sustainability uh, means um, the greener society. So the, for instance, we as a listed company, uh, the, if we get more and more investment for that big uh, this, uh, institute, uh, we uh, should show our sustainability or the greener uh, society, uh, the support or environment. So that is one of the drivers. From the investment point of view. Okay, so it sounds then like uh, even in uh, political climates uh, substantially different th than uh, China, you know, the, your more liberal democracies. Maybe the United States is one of the kind of extreme examples there, especially with their um, litigious <laughs> practices. Yeah. Um, that uh, we might have kind of uh, more market driven, or you know, uh, the, the, if we're focused on the stock market as the possible. Um, or, you know, some sort of differentiator in the market, that, that is itself enough incentive, perhaps, uh, without some of these more top-down initiatives. We hope. <laughs> um, well, I see we're almost out of time here. Um, are there any um, final points? We didn't get to uh, all the issues, um, but uh, is there any other um, uh, final comments that anybody would like to make? Just kind of I mean, go I'll around. Yeah, I'll step in and say one thing very quickly is what we're seeing going back to food waste, because, you know, as we're seeing uh, many people who are food insecure, 50 million people in the United States right now, which is 50 million too many, this this idea around how do how do we kind of think about this differently? And so there, there's two there's two aspects. Number one is when we're ordering online figuring out a way through AI, right? If I like green bananas or if I like bananas with brown dots or if I like, you know, yellow bananas, how, how do I get that product, right? Number one, and how does the retailer know that that's what I want? And then number two, through RFID, right, if, or, you know, kind of blockchain, how do we kind of track and trace and just make sure that, right, if the trucks are getting warm, if the environment isn't, you know, kind of what it should be, how can we kind of take down the food waste? Uh, we, in preparation for the call today, we spoke to a large RFID company and they said they've, they've been able to just by very simple, like very basic track and trace, um, reduce food waste by 50%. And so you're talking, you know, still 20 percent, which is once again too much. But I, I do think it's something that we can do that's easy. It's not incredibly expensive. There's many different ways than just RFID. But that is absolutely, you know, kind of a step forward. So I I, I just I urge all of us and, you know, to work together, put our heads together and, and see what we can commit to and, and what that means in terms of dollars and cents. Exactly, Deborah. As you said, we could actually end world hunger by 2030. So we could. Uh, we could uh, solve SDG2 with the, the means that we have today. And isn't that uh, amazing that we are in that uh, position today? I believe that's uh, incredible. It's pretty amazing. Indeed. Yeah. Well, um, I'm afraid that uh, we are out of time. I'm getting a message here. So um, I just wanted to thank you uh, all for your participation, especially to our panelists and also to anybody who's uh, joined us here. And, of course, to uh, Horace for um, uh, scheduling us and uh, uh, allowing us to have this uh, session today. So thank you all. I think we ended on a fairly positive note. Um, so, um, yes, let's uh, all green our supply chains more. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.